Christmas by Alexander McLaren. John 3.14 Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I have chosen this text for the sake of one word in it, that solemn must, which was so often on our Lord's lips. I have no purpose of dealing with the remainder of this clause, nor indeed with it at all, except as one instance of his use of the expression. But I felt it might be interesting and might set old truths in a brighter light if we gather together the instances in which Christ speaks of the great necessity which dominated his life and shaped even small acts. The expression is most frequently used in reference to the passion and resurrection. There are many instances in the other Gospels in which he speaks of that must. The first of these is that of my text. Then there is another class, of which his word to his mother when a twelve-year-old child may be taken as a type. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Where the mysterious consciousness of a special relation to God in the child's heart drew him to the temple and to his father's work. Other similar instances are those in which he responded to the multitude when they wanted to keep him to themselves. I must preach in other cities also. Whereas when he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while well, it is day. Yet another aspect of the same necessity is presented when looking far beyond the earthly work and suffering. He discerned the future triumph which was to be the issue of these and said, Other sheep I have, them also I must bring. And yet another is in reference to a very small matter. His selection of a place for a few hours rest on his last fateful journey to Jerusalem. When he said, Zacchaeus, today I must abide at thy house. Now, if we put these instances together, we shall get some precious glimpses into our Lord's heart and his view of life. 1. Here we see Christ recognizing and accepting the necessity for his death. My text, if we accept John's gospel, contributes an altogether new element to our conception of our Lord as announcing his death. For the other three gospels lay emphasis on it as being part of his teaching, especially during the latter stage of his ministry. But it does not follow that he began to think about it or to see it when he began to speak about it. There are reasons for the earlier comparative reticence, and there is no ground for the conclusion that then first began to dawn upon a disappointed enthusiast the grim reality that his work was not going to prosper and that martyrdom was necessary. That is a notion that has been frequently upheld of late years, but to me it seems altogether incongruous with the facts of the case. And if John's gospel is a true record, that theory is shivered against this text, which represents him at the very beginning of his career. The time when, according to that other theory, he was full of the unusual, buoyant, and baseless anticipations of a reformer commencing his course. As telling Nicodemus, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In like manner, in the previous chapter of the same gospel, we have the significant, though enigmatical, utterance, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. With the evangelist's authoritative comment, he spake of the temple of his body. So from the beginning of his career, the end was clear before him. And why must he go to the cross? Not merely, as the other evangelists put it, in order that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets. It was not that Jesus must die because the prophets had said that Messiah should, but that the prophets had said that Messiah should because Jesus must. There was a far deeper necessity than the fulfillment of any prophetic utterance, even the necessity which shaped the utterance. The work of Jesus Christ could not be done unless he died. He could not be the Savior of the world unless he was the sacrifice for the sins of the world. We cannot see all the grounds of that solemn imperative, but this we can see, that it was because of the requirements of the divine righteousness and because of the necessities of sinful men and so Christ was no martyr's death, who had to die as the penalty of the faithful discharge of his duty. It was not the penalty that he paid for doing his work, but it was the work itself. Not that gracious life, nor the loveliness of perfect deeds, 
nor his words of sweet wisdom, nor his acts of transcendent power, equaled only by the pity that moved the power, completed his task, but he came to give his life a ransom for many. Must is a hard word. It may express an unwelcome necessity. Was this, unne- was this necessity unwelcome? When he said the Son of Man must be lifted up, was he shrinking or reluctantly submitting? Ah, no. He must die because he would save, and he would save because he did love. His filial obedience to God coincided with his pity for men, and not merely in obedience to the requirements of the divine righteousness, but in compassion for the necessities of sinners, necessity was laid upon him. O brother, nothing held Christ to the cross but his own desire to save us. Neither priests nor Romans carried him thither. What fastened, him, what fastened him to it was not the nails driven by rude hands. And the reason why he did not, as the taunters bade him do, come down from it, was neither a physical nor a moral necessity unwelcome to himself, but the yielding of his own will to do all which was needed for man's salvation. This sacrifice was bound to the altar by the cords of love. We have heard of martyrs who have refused to be tied to the stake and have kept themselves motionless in the center of the fierce flames by the force of their wills. Jesus Christ fastened himself to the cross and died because he would. And oh, if we think of that sweet, serene life as having clear before it from the very first steps that grim end, how infinitely it gains in pathetic beauty and in heart-touchingness. What wonderful self-abnegation. How he was at leisure from himself, with a heart of pity for every sorrow, and loins girt for all service, though, though for all his life the cross closed the vista. Think, human shrinking was felt by him. Think, it was so held back that his purpose never faltered. Think, each of us may say, he must die, because he would save me. And then ask, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Two, in a second class of these utterances, we see Christ compelled, Christ impelled by filial obedience in the consciousness of his mission. We see not that I must be about my father's business. That was a strange utterance for a boy of 12. It seems to negative the su- supposition that what is called the messianic consciousness dawned upon Jesus Christ first after his baptism and the descent of the Spirit. But however that may be, it in the similar passages to which I have already referred, bearing upon his discharge of his work prior to his death, teach that the necessity was an inward necessity springing from his consciousness of sonship and his recognition of the work that he had to do. And so he is our great example of spontaneous obedience, which does violence to itself if it does not obey. It was instinct that sent the boy into the temple. Where should a son be but in his father's house? How could he not be doing his father's business? Thus he stands before us the pattern for the only obedience that is worth calling so. The obedience which would be pained and ill at ease unless it were doing the work of God. Religion is meant to make it a second nature, or as I have ventured to call it, an instinct, a spontaneous, uncalculating, irrepressible desire to be in fellowship with God, and to be doing His will. That is the meaning of our Christianity. There is no obedience in reluctant obedience. For service is slavery, not service. Christianity is given for the specific purpose that it may bring us so into touch with Jesus Christ as that the mind which was in Him may be in us. And we too may be able to say, with a kind of wonder that people should have expected to find us in any other place or doing anything else. We see not that because I am a son, I must be about my father's business. As certainly as a sunflower follows the sun, so certainly will a man animated by the mind that was in Jesus Christ, like him, find his very life's breath in doing the father's will. So then, brethren, What about our grudging service? What about our reluctant obedience? 
What about the widespread mistake that religion prohibits wished for things and enforces unwelcome duties? If my Christianity does not make me recoil from what it forbids and spring eagerly to what it commends, my Christianity is, ve is of very little use. If when in the temple we are like idle boys in school, always casting glances at the clock and the door, and wishing ourselves outside, we may just as well be out as in. Glad obedience is true obedience. Only he who can say, Thy law is within my heart, and I do thy will because I love thee, and cannot but do as thou desirest, has found the joy possible to a Christian life. It is not harsh and crabbed, as those that look upon it from the outside may suppose, but musical and full of sweetness. There is nothing more blessed than when I choose covers exactly the same ground as I ought. And when duty is delight, delight will never become disgust, nor joy pass away. 3. We see in yet another use of this great must, Christ anticipating his future triumph. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Striking as these words are in themselves, they are still more striking when we notice their connection. For they follow immediately upon his utterance about laying down his life for the sheep. So then this work was beyond the cross, and whatever it was, it was to be done after he had died. I need not point out to you how far afield Christ's vision goes out into the dim, waste places, where on the dark mountains the straying sheep are torn and frightened and starving. I need not dwell upon how far ahead in the future his glance travels, or how magnificent and how rebuking to our petty narrowness the great, the great word is, there shall be one flock, not fold, and they shall be one, not because they are within the bounds of any visible fold, but because they are gathered round the one shepherd, and in their common relation to him are knit together in unity. But what sort of a man is this who considers that his widest work is to be done by him after he is dead? Them also I must bring. Thou? How? When? Surely such word, words as these side by side with a clear provision of the death that was so soon to come are either meaningless or the utterance of an arrogance border, bordering on insanity, or they anticipate what an evangelist de declares did take place, that the Lord was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God, whilst his servants went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord also working with them in confirming the word with the signs he wrought. Them also I must bring. That is not merely a necessity rooted in the nature of God and the wants of men. It is not merely a necessity springing from Christ's filial obedience and sense of a mission. But it is a must of destiny, a must which recognizes the sure results of his passion, a must which implies the power of the cross to be the reconciliation of the world, and so for all pessimistic thoughts today, or at any time, and when Christian men's hearts may be trembling for the ark of God, although perhaps there may be little reason for the tremor, and in the face of all blatant antagonisms and of proud Goliaths, despising the foolishness of preaching, we fall back upon Christ's great must. It is written in the councils of heaven more unchangeably than the heavens, it is guaranteed by the power of the cross. It is certain by the eternal life of the crucified Savior that he will one day be the king of humanity and must bring his wandering sheep to couch in peace, one flock round one shepherd. Four, lastly, we have Christ applying the greatest principle to the smallest duty. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. Today I must abide in thy house. Why must he? Because Zacchaeus was to be saved and was worth saving. What was the must? To stop for an hour or two on his road to the cross? So he teaches us that in a life penetrated by the thought of the divine will, which we gladly obey, there are no things too great 
and none too trivial to be brought under the dominion of that law and to be regulated by that divine necessity. Obedience is obedience, whether in large things or in small. There is no scale of magnitude applicable to the distinction between God's will and that which is not God's will. Gravitation rules the motes that dance in the sunshine, as well as the mass of Jupiter. A triangle with its apex in the sun and its base beyond the solar system has the same properties and comes under the same laws as one that a schoolboy scrawls upon his slate. God's truth is not too great to rule the smallest duties. The star in the east was a guide to the humble house at Bethlehem. And there are starry truths high in the heavens that avail for our guidance in the smallest acts of faith. So, brethren, bring your doing under that all-embracing law of duty, duty which is the heathen expression for the will of God. There are great regions of life in which lower necessities have play. Circumstances are past, bias and temper, relationship, friendship, civic duty, and the like. All of these bring their necessities, but let us think of them all as being what indeed they are, manifestations to us of the will of our Father. There are great tracts of life in which either of two courses may be right, and we are left to the decision of choice rather than of duty. But high above all these, let us see towering that divine necessity. It is a daily struggle to bring I will to coincide with I ought, and there is only one adequate and always powerful way of securing that coincidence, and it is to keep close to Jesus Christ and to drink in his spirit. Then, when duty and delight are conterminous, the rough places will be plain, and the crooked things straight, and every mountain shall be brought low, and every valley shall be exalted, and the life will be blessed, and service will be freedom. Joy and liberty and power and peace will fill our hearts when this is the law of our being. All that the Lord has spoken, that must I do.